Well, praise the Lord. I uh, glad to have all of you back with us. I know there's still some that are on holiday a little bit, and uh, so we're we're into a great holiday season and a great season to celebrate Jesus Christ. Uh, I was thinking about this, uh, about all this shopping going on. This says a woman goes on an all-day shopping trip. After stopping at several stores, she goes to her car to end the long, hot day. She gets in, shuts the door, and hears a loud boom like a gunshot, and her head is hit and pushed forward. She is so frightened, she passes out. When she wakes up, she reaches back to touch her head, and she feels her brains. So she holds them in with her hands. A while later, an officer approaches the car and asks her to roll down the window. She can't because she's holding in her brains. When he finally gets the window down, he finds her brains are actually a roll of canned biscuits that have exploded and stuck to her head. <clears throat> yes, this is a blonde, and yes, this is a true story. <clears throat> okay, hallelujah. And even if your hair's dyed blonde, that still covers you. All right. <clears throat> All right, so we're starting a new series. We're talking about the greatest, and uh, we're going to kind of apply it to different aspects that you and I have, and, uh, and I believe God has a great future for you. Everybody say, God has a great future for me. I mean, he loves you. He cares about you. Uh, he wants you to have a great life. He wants you to have a great trip through this life and then to leave a great legacy behind. And so we're going to be talking about some of these things. And as always, we need to have ears to hear. Do you have ears to hear? That is a question Jesus would always ask. He would say, let him that has ears to hear, let him hear. And that means an attitude uh, like James, Jesus' half-brother would always say. Um, he would make this statement. He would talk about uh, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. That's your attitude of receiving. A lot of people, when they hear the word, they throw up a because it ain't what they like. It ain't what they think. It ain't what they were taught. So they throw up a shield and they don't receive the Word of God, <clears throat> then it can impact their life. So we want to know what the book says. Everybody say, I want to know and understand what the book says. Amen? So, so we're going to do that. How many of you are ready to get in agreement? Father, we just come to you in Jesus' name, and uh, I'm asking you to speak through my lips. I pray for each person with thin sound of my voice. Give us ears to hear. Help us not only to hear, but help us to know how to apply it in our daily life to change our life, to change our family, to change our, our future, and for us to be able to help bless the world with the knowledge of Jesus Christ and accomplish your will. Thank you for ministering to us. We love you, and we thank you for your goodness and mercy in Jesus' name. And everybody who agreed with the prayer said, <clears throat> amen. All right, so we're going to start over here in Matthew chapter 10, Matthew 10, verse 38 and 39. <clears throat> says he does here's Jesus he who does not take up his cross and follow me cleave steadfastly to me conforming wholly to my example in living and if need be in dying also is not worthy of me whoever finds his lower life will lose it the higher life and whoever loses his lower life on my account will find it the higher life the word find here is the greek word that means he will get or he will obtain so according to this, there are two paths or there are two lives that you can have. In fact, this affects every human that's ever been born on the planet, except for one, he was really the God-man, Jesus Christ. But everybody else is affected by this. You have choices to make, and even Jesus had choices to make. You can choose to go the lower life, or you can choose a different path that he says is a higher life. And whether you realize it or not, you're making that choice every day, there are millions that have already made their choice. They've chosen they're going to go to the lower life. They're going to follow that and all that pertains to that, and they don't care about anything spiritual. They think Christianity is nonsense. They don't have time for that. That's a crutch for weak people, and they just think that we're deceived and living in a fantasy world. So they've already made their choice. We pray for them that they will reconsider, but you and I have a choice. Every, every human has a choice on these two paths for life. This seemed to be a theme with Jesus. In fact, a little bit earlier in Matthew 7, notice what he said it this way, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. 
Now, when he says there's few who find it, he doesn't mean that there's few because it is hidden and you can't, you can't find it. It's a, it's a way that is hidden and nobody knows this path that leads to life or this narrow gate that they, they can't find the narrow gate. The reason that it is difficult and there's only few who the word find there means obtain it is because it's talking about a way that requires you to have Jesus to follow God and obey God's word. And so that's why it's difficult. It's difficult for humans to humble themselves, to rely on God, put their faith and confidence in him, and then to adjust their life to what his word says. We, we as humans, we want to make our own way. We want to choose our own path. We want, in essence, we want to be our own God. So all of us are facing this path, a higher life or a lower life. Everybody say higher life or lower life. And you're making choices every day that are going to take you on that path and take you down that path. Um, faced with this choice, we can see it all began in the Garden of Eden. This is not something that's just new to our generation. Every generation, every person has faced this. In Genesis chapter 3, we see here, and I don't have time to read the whole story. You should know about Adam and Eve put in the garden, and God tells them, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that came up, and it says in verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, uh, You won't die. God said, in the day you eat there, if you'll die. So the serpent, he was very subtle, very deceptive. You know, the devil appears as an angel of light. He doesn't show up in your life with a pitchfork and horns or something evil or hideous. He is like an angel of light. It's like, oh my gosh, I've been looking for this my whole life. This is truth. This is wonderful. It's an angel of light. So this serpent shows up. Uh, the devil usurped his body and he didn't look like a snake at the time. So it wasn't a creepy snake talking. At the time, he was a different type of being. We don't know what, but obviously he could talk and, and Eve was there talking to him. He ended up being cursed and then became, uh, lost his legs and became a <clears throat> serpent crawling on the ground as part of his curse. So the serpent said unto the woman, you won't die, for God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be open, and you'll be as gods. You'll be as gods knowing good and evil. And when the woman, notice this, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat also. So <clears throat> you see that this, temptation she had that, that took her and Adam and their descendants and the human race into a path of <clears throat> destruction and a path of selfishness and hate and fear and greed and death, that it was the lower life and it was caused by what the New Testament, 1 John 2 says, the lust of the flesh. I mean, it was good for food. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, it looked pleasant. The word pleasant means desirable. So it was the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It would make her wise, and she'd be like God. So you can see these are the, th the things that lead us into a life of deception, a life that is the lower life, and that's what happened to humanity. And we see this all through, uh, all through our culture, all through our history and the history of the world. Uh, the world says that a great life is having riches, it's having power, it's having possessions, fame, beauty, sex with anybody that you desire, having excitement, having the adventure, and that if you get all of this stuff, you obtain the wealth and the power and the pleasure and you, the beauty and the fame and all of that, that's what makes life great. And they seek the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And that's where they're headed. But history shows that people who follow that, they may get fame. They may be beautiful. They may be powerful. But it ends up, they may get wealth and riches where they can buy anything. But history shows us from Genghis Khan to Napoleon to Howard Hughes to Hank Williams to Elvis to Marilyn Monroe Kurt Cobain, Michael Jackson, Prince, Whitney Houston, and you could make a list of thousands of people in history that have been famous, powerful, wealthy, beautiful, had everything, 
and their life ended in misery and drug abuse and suicide and drunkenness and just a horrible life in their relationships because it is, it is a trap. When you follow the lower life, it takes you down to lower living and eventually will end up bringing destruction. In fact, Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14, in the, the Message Bible says, there's a way of life that looks harmless enough. Look again. It leads straight to hell. Sure, those people appear to be having a good time, but all that laughter will end in heartbreak. I mean, you, you and I, I mean, maybe you've never known anybody that was, you know, rich and powerful like some of the ones we've named, but we've probably all known people in life who had great talent and ability. Maybe they did achieve some kind of success. Maybe they, you know, enjoyed doing this, doing that. They followed the lower life, and it looked like everything was cool. They got what they wanted. I mean, they were popular. When they went to the bar, everybody knew who they were. Everybody's high-fiving them, celebrating them. Man, you're the greatest. You're this, you're that. You did this, you accomplished that. They got all of this stuff going on. Uh, but if you follow that life, you find out it ends in despair. Many times loneliness. The ones that have wealth, then they're fearful that somebody's going to con them out of it or steal it from them. It's a life that, well, it's just a lower life. But there is a different path. There is a higher life that you and I can live. And so we're going to be talking about some of those things. Obviously, this is a huge subject, and so you couldn't go through all of the things. So I'm just going to give you three things that I think are very important uh, about living the greatest life here on earth and then getting rewarded in the life to come. So the first thing that is important and it's paramount to all of us is learning and applying God's word to your decisions. Um, this is our roadmap for life. Jesus said, thy word is truth. So, so when you walk in the truth, the truth will do what for you? It'll set you free from the things that would be destructive and harmful to you in your life. So in Proverbs 3, verse 1 and 2, it says, My son, forget not my law or teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days, notice this part, years of a life worth living, tranquility, inward and outward, and continuing through old age till death. Everybody say, old age till death. These shall they add to you. Well, I mean, I want that. I want a life that's filled with inward and outward tranquility, length of days, a life worth living. I don't want to end up, you know, there's a lot of people they end up and, you know, they went through this, went through that and their last years they're laying in a, in a nursing home somewhere drooling on themselves with no quality of life. You don't have to end up that way. Are you here? Now you got to do something not to. You got to make some godly choices and you got to exercise your faith that you're living long and living strong. But he says you could have a good life, a life worth living, all the way through old age till death. Everybody say, through old age till death. Say it again, through old age till death. It's a life you can live. It's possible. But you're going to have to do some of the things that he said here. You're going to have to apply God's word in your life and follow that. Um, it's wonderful and amazing how life begins to straighten out and get better when we apply God's word to our priorities, our behavior, our attitudes. It's not the problems of life that defeat people. It's how you respond to the problem or the disappointments in life or the hurts in life. How do you respond? We're all going to have trouble in life. You don't get to go through life floating on flowery beds of ease. There's trouble. There's tests. There's trials. People will be nasty to you. People will hurt you intentionally and unintentionally. That's life. But guess what? You don't have to respond in like kind. You don't have to respond with the lower life that they're bringing towards you. You can reach out and respond on a higher level and get much higher results in the span of a lifetime. Amen. You know, I, uh, I, I was born again when I was a child, but I never went to church hardly at all. 
<clears throat> so I grew up self-centered, had a bad temper, and uh, very immature spiritually. Well, finally, um, I made a decision I'm going to serve God. The Lord dealt with me. I, I knew he had healed me. I'd been saved as a child. When I was 13, I was instantly healed of chronic asthma. I don't mean that I got better. I mean I was instantly healed. I prayed in something like warm oil. felt like you opened up a can of honey and poured it on my head and it rolled down. I could feel something, but there was no, there was just like light flowed down over me. When it got to my lungs, I was instantly healed. So uh, even after that, I really didn't serve God for any length of time. Never went to church. Read my Bible that night. I did. I got up in a hotel. I was in a hotel and uh, deathly sick when I started praying and instantly healed. I got up and dug out one of those Gideon Bibles, slid back the curtain in the hotel, you know, lights out there, and I'm trying to read the Bible. All of a sudden, I was interested in God, but it didn't last very long. So I ended up, and uh, when I was 20 years old, I made a rededication to the Lord. I, I just sat out there and uh, decided that, you know, my sisters had invited me to a, a meeting. I went to the meeting. I didn't really like preachers too much. I thought they were all a bunch of weenies. And, uh, but they said, no, this guy's different. You know, he's different. So he was a speaker, guest speaker. I went in, heard him, and I sat out there and listened, and I thought, you know, it's only right God has healed me. And I do believe in God and believe in Jesus. I, I should give him my life. And so I did. I walked up and dedicated my life to the Lord. And, and then I started, I knew, well, if he's going to be Lord, I got to start following what he said. So I started reading my Bible shortly after that. Well, then I got married. And, but I was very immature emotionally, very immature spiritually, didn't know anything. She was a little more mature than me. She had went to church and been raised and heard a lot more than I had. But I was a horse's ass. I was a horse's person. <laughs> and uh, we wouldn't have stayed married very long if I hadn't have really got in the, the flow of I'm going to correct myself with the Word of God. But I started changing. I've repented more than any of you ever have. Because I just, I mean, I'd have to repent and then I'd pray. I got on the track of reading my Bible. I'd fast two days a week, do nothing but water and study. I, I, I'd, I went... I guess I turned into a fanatic, a Bible fanatic, people would think. And I didn't hardly do anything except study the Bible, <clears throat> read books about the Bible, and that became a lifestyle. And because of the mercy of God, then I began to change, and I could see that I had to change or else we wouldn't have been able to stay married because I was, I was not a nice person, and I had a bad temper, and was, you know, just mixed up and messed up. And, but we all have some baggage that we bring with us when we come to Jesus. Is that true? And we have to deal with those things. But if you're willing to deal with it and to repent and to apply God's word to your decisions, then it starts changing everything. And so as I did that, our life started getting better and better. And it's amazing, you know, how God can just start taking your life and all of a sudden it starts getting better by a degree and then another degree and another degree and another degree. And it ends up, we have great marriage now. We'll be married 44 years here, um, coming up this next year. And so uh, <clears throat> she stayed with me that long. And be honest about it, I'm really a great husband. <laughs> Don't you forget it either. So, so I mean, we have great marriage and uh, we, we enjoy, we spend more time together than just about anybody because we work together here at the church and then, we do stuff together all the time, and, and so, but, but I enjoy life, and, but it came from this of, of learning how to apply God's decisions in our life, and uh, it's wonderful how it straightens everything out. Notice um, in Proverbs 3 what it says here in verse 13 through 17, it says, happy, blessed, considered, fortunate to be admired is the man who finds skillful and godly wisdom. Now, let's stop a minute. If you know Jesus' teaching, you know in Matthew 7, he told us what wisdom is. Remember, wisdom is whoever hears these sayings of mine and does it, I liken him unto a wise man. Okay, so wisdom is hearing the sayings of Jesus and doing it. And it says, if you find this skillful and godly wisdom and you gain understanding and insight, now notice how you get it, learning from God's word and life's experiences. So it has to be based on God's word. It's not just experience. You can have experiences in life 
and really you, it doesn't really help you. So you got to learn from God's word and then how to apply that in your life and you see the results of it, life's experience. And then it talks about this wisdom. It says, wisdom's profit is better than the profit of silver. Her gain is better than fine gold. That's pretty amazing. She's more precious than rubies. Nothing you can wish for compares to her in value. Long life is in her right hand. How many of you want a long life? And it says, and in her left hand are riches and honors. So he says, if you go after this, and it goes on to say all of her, her ways are pleasantness and favor and all her paths are peace. When you go after this high life, it doesn't mean you miss out on life. It doesn't mean you have just a, a drab, boring, dull life down here, nothing good, and you just are singing, build me a cabin over in the corner of glory land, and I don't want anything down here. And it, you know, no, God will take you to a higher level. You'll have more enjoyable life. You'll have peace and tranquility. You'll be able to enjoy the greatest life that there is on earth, walking with God and applying his principles in your life. Um, Proverbs 14, 9 here where it, it says it this way, the stupid ridicule right and wrong, but a moral life is a favored life. What? The stupid ridicule right and wrong. When you start saying, I'm going to apply God's word, well, yeah, there's moral laws in there. You don't lie. You don't steal. You don't commit adultery. There's a whole lot of stuff that's in there. You don't have any other gods before Almighty God. You start adjusting your life to these things. Yeah, some people think it's stupid and you're foolish. You know, they've done all kinds of studies about married people and people who live a moral life. You know, married people have more sex than non-married people? Do you know married people have better sex than non-married people? I mean, if that's what you're looking for, and I think probably, you know, that's a pretty good thing. If God invented it, it's pretty good. But I'm just saying there's a lot of stuff people in life, they have all kind of misconceptions about. But if we'll live a moral life, it's a favored life. It's a favored life, it says. And the word favored here means satisfying. The Hebrew word means satisfying, desirable, delightful, and favored. So as you apply God's word, what, is it, what did he say in here? That's why you need to read your Bible. We ask you to read one chapter five days a week. One cha everybody say one chapter, five days a week. And in the run of a year, see, you can read the whole New Testament. And so you should be finishing up here. Getting close to finishing the New Testament if you started doing that at the beginning of the year. And then you can read Proverbs or start in the Old Testament and read some of that every year. It's good, but if you do that you, and you start applying it, it gives you a great life and you can have a better life. How many of you since you've started hearing God's word in a planet, your life's got better and better? You can honestly say it's got better and better. That's just true. And so we need to hear God's word, apply it to our decisions in life. All right, the second thing is, and this is very important, you can never get very far away from this, be loving and forgiving. Everybody say, be loving and forgiving. And when I say loving, I mean, I'm talking about with a God kind of love, be kind, be patient to people. Matthew chapter 18, notice what it says. At that time, the disciples came up and asked Jesus, who then is really the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's a pretty good question. They had been discussing it. I'm greater than you are. I'm greater than you are and all of this stuff. They had that discussion among themselves and Jesus straightened them out on it. He called a little child to himself and put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you repent, change, turn about and become like little children. Here's what he means by that. Trusting, lowly, loving and forgiving. You can never enter the kingdom of heaven at all. Whoever will humble himself, that's me and you, the will, will you do that? That's a choice you have to make. Whoever will humble himself therefore and become like little, this little child, trusting, lowly, loving, and forgiving is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And I'll just tell you that, it'll give you a great life. Trusting, lowly, loving, and forgiving. Everybody say loving and forgiving. And you're going to be tempted in life not to forgive people, to hold grudges, to do all those kind of things. But if you will take the higher road and be loving and be forgiving, not just to people who are good to you, but people who are nasty and mean. That's the whole, whole nother level. 
are in John 13, 34 and 35, we have this new commandment. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And he said, by this shall all men know you're my disciples. And the word love there is agape. You agape one another. It's the God kind of love, unselfish love. And he said, that's how people will know you're my disciples. And you can't get very far away from that love thing. You can't just, when I'm teaching, I have a couple of series that I teach on love. You can't just say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to really, you know, apply this when he's on the subject of love. I mean, this has to become a way of life. You have to adjust your life to this walking in this commandment of love. And when you do, it affects everything. It starts changing everything. It's not how many Jesus bumper stickers you have or how fancy your prayers are, but how do you treat others from the waitress at the restaurant to people at stores to irritating relatives during the holidays, especially when they're not nice to you. Almost anybody can be good to people who are good to them. Almost. Now, there are some people I've, I've found in life. There are some people, even when you're good to them, they're still a horses. They're still not good back. But, but most people, when you're good to them, they'll be good to you. I mean, even gang members are that way. Non-believers, I mean, they're good to the other gang members. They're good to their, their crew they run with. If they're good to them, they're... I mean, they can even do that. But the higher life, we're talking about the greatest life requires that you're good to people that are mean to you. That you bless them that curse you. I mean, that sounds crazy. You pray for them that despitefully use you? I mean, that is not natural. I mean, that is not natural. Natural people do, don't do that. Somebody's mean and nasty. The natural person responds the same way. You're rude to me, I'll be rude to you. If you don't like that, go jump in the creek. And we, ha we have, uh, why? That's natural. But Jesus said we're not supposed to be that way. We're supposed to have another kind of love. We're supposed to forgive, be loving and be forgiving and not take it into account when people do us wrong. In Mark chapter 11, Jesus was talking about prayer and he gets down to verse 25 and says, when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone forgiving, let it drop, leave it, let it go in order that your father in heaven can forgive you your own failings and shortcomings and let them drop. If you, wanna, if you, if you study people, if you look at people's lives, if you find people who really do this and they forgive you'll see that they're happy people, that they have good lives. But there's not a whole lot of Christians that really do that. They'll get mad, their feelings will get hurt, and so they're out and they're talking about their relatives or their friends or whoever did this or that business person, and they have this ought and ill will and they carry it with them. And Jesus said, you, you, you can't do that. You've got to get rid of that. If you want the high life, if you want to live the low life that will lead to destruction, then that's the way you live. You know, there's a great story in the Bible, um, and I'm not going to go over there because it's uh, several chapters. starts in about Genesis 37 and goes through Genesis 45, and it's the story of Joseph, which, and if you study Bible characters, the life of Joseph was incredible. He's one of the most, I don't know, besides Jesus, I don't know, Jesus, Joseph, and Daniel, incredible when you look at their lives, their lives that they had and how they responded and how they acted and, and their lives were incredible. And Joseph, I mean, incredible life, became prime minister of Egypt, wealth, power, riches. But you can see why God used Joseph. Joseph had this attitude of loving and forgiving on a tremendous level. And what, what has always been astounding to me, he wasn't born again. He wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. I had enough trouble and still do being loving and forgiving and I'm born again and I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And yet this man would rise to the occasion and if you look at his life, his life just blossomed and I mean incredible life because you can see how he acted under pressure when people were, I mean, absolutely horrible to him. 
you know, his father loved him. You remember the story of Joseph. He had all these brothers and they hated him. The Bible says they couldn't even speak peaceably to him. His father sends him to check on them and see how they're doing out in the field with the flocks. He heads that way and they hate him so much. You talk about a dysfunctional family. They see him coming and say, let's kill him. Let's kill him. All of them. Now, the older brother, his conscience got to bother him, and he said, well, wait, we won't get any money if we kill him. Let's sell him as a slave. And so he intended, it said, that he was going to put him in holding and then try to slip in and let him get away. So Joseph gets there. They capture him, throw him in a pit. And before Reuben, I think, was the oldest, could get him out, then uh, a, a caravan comes by, you know, headed to Egypt. And so they got Joseph out, sold him into slavery. Here he is, a teenager, goes into foreign land. He gets bought. He's now property. He's a slave. You know, he's, God is with him. He honors God even in the middle of his mess. He ends up in prison because a woman tried to seduce him and, and have sex with him. And he ran and she lied and accused him of rape. He ends up in prison, spends years in prison. But then he gets out and he interprets a dream for Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said, there's nobody who could do what you did. You must have the spirit of the living God in you. And he makes him prime minister over the whole country. And so the dream he interpreted was about there would be a famine in the land. There'd be seven bad years. There'd be first seven good years of prosperity and seven bad years. And, and so... Pharaoh says, all right, I'm making you leader over the country. Then you take care of that since you know what's going to happen. And so he became prime minister. He gave him his ring. Everybody bowed the knee to Joseph. And so lo and behold, a few years, two years actually passed by after this. And Joseph's brothers all showed up because there's no food anywhere else except in Egypt. And they show up and Joseph recognizes them. Now, I mean, you couldn't have a better setup than that. I mean, wouldn't it be fun just send guys out and just have an ax, you know, that they cut heads off with and say, hey, you guys over here, line up over there. We're going to cut your head off. I mean, wouldn't you feel like doing that? They wanted to kill you and sell you into slavery? I, don't look at me like you're Snow White. I, I just sure want to say, bring that ax over here. But he didn't. You would have at least said, all right, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to throw you guys in prison. But he didn't. Now, he tested them a little bit, did some funny stuff with them, and he hid hid money back in their saddle that they paid for food and all of this stuff. And so they're terrified of this ruler of Egypt. They didn't recognize him, didn't know who he was. This is the furthest thing from their mind that this little brother of theirs would be the ruler of this nation. But lo and behold, everything works out. They come back in. He keeps having them come back. And one day he reveals himself to them and he stands up. He sends all of the guards out. He says, I'm Joseph. And they were speechless. So they were terrified, speechless. They knew, well, this is the end for us. But what is amazing with this guy, Joseph, you talk about being loving and forgiving. Everybody say loving and forgiving. I mean, what magnanimity of heart did this guy have? He said, guys, you don't have to be scared. He said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to feed you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of all your children, all of your grandchildren, all of your flocks. I want you to go back and get everything. I'm going to send food with you, supplies with you. I'm going to send wagons with you, bring everybody back. And I'm going to give you the best of the land of Egypt, you your children, your grandchildren, I'm going to take care of you. I mean, loving and forgiving, it's amazing. You can see people with that attitude of heart. Everybody say, loving and forgiving. So I ask you, is that you? Or do you have grudges? Are you mad at somebody? And do you have that? You know, I, I am not a perfect man, never claim to be, and I can get irritated and mad just like anybody else, and I have to repent like anybody else. But I can stand up here and say I have no ought against any man on the world, in the world or any woman in the world or anybody else because I made the decision I'm going to be loving, I'm going to be forgiving, it don't matter. You know, it's amazing, you know, when you preach and you're on, you, you know, you're on social media and stuff, you get nasty letters from people 
And, you know, I just, I let it go in one ear and out the other ear. Why? I'm not going to have any odd against any human being. Are you here? You just got to let it go. People are going to do stuff, but you got to leave it. You got to drop it. You got to let it go. You got to learn to be loving and you got to learn to be forgiving. And you got to learn to control your, your, your mouth. That's part of it. Don't act like how much you love somebody. If you're, you're berating them with your words and attacking them, they don't do what you like, and they didn't do this right, and they didn't do that, and you start just hammering on people, you've got a problem, and you need to get it under control. Amen? You've got to control your words because that is demonstrating lovingness and forgiving. You know, Albert Einstein, he, he made a drawing one time and talked about success. And somebody had asked him the formula for success. So he wrote it out. He said, if A is success, then success is A equals X plus Y plus Z. He said, uh, X is work, Y is play, and Z is learn to keep your mouth shut. You know, when you get mad, what, what do you want to do first? Don't look at me out there. What do you want? What, what do you want to do for you're mad? What do you want to do? You want to start. You want to start doing some talking, baby. But God wants us to be loving and forgiving. Everybody say loving and forgiving. And guess what? You're choosing a higher way of life. You're putting spiritual law into motion that's going to help you and bless you. And you have to forgive and you have to be loving. And I tell you what, that's going to help you to live the greatest life of peace down here. Um, I got this story years ago. In fact, back in the '90s, it was written in. Bits and Pieces magazine. And uh, it's a story of a, a young boy named Paco in Spain. And him and his father had a big fight. He was a teenager. And they had a huge knockdown, drag out fight. And the teenage son slammed the door, left, said, I never want to see you again. And there, I mean, the father was right there with him. Get out of here. Don't ever want to see you. And so the Paco left. And, and you know, for years passed by. And so, for whatever reason, the father decided he would try to reconcile with his son. And so, he didn't know how. He didn't know where he went. Didn't know if he's even alive. He didn't know if he's dead. Didn't know if he's alive, whatever it was. So, he started trying to find him, asking different people. And he thought the last time he'd been heard from was he was in Madrid, Spain. And so, the father uh, took out an ad in the newspaper in Madrid, and he put in the ad... Dear Paco, meet me in front of the Hotel Montana at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, Papa. And he was hoping, you know, maybe his son would see that and he'd show up at the Hotel Montana and he'd be out there and uh, he'd get to reconcile with the son. So Saturday rolls around and the father goes and when he gets in front of the Hotel Montana, the police are there. And they have got all of this huge crowd and come to find out there were 800 young men named Paco who showed up wanting to be reconciled to their father. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? You know, there's a whole lot of Pacos that you work with, go to school with, relatives, friends, and, and really they're, they're wanting somebody that'll be the real deal and show the God kind of love and be loving and forgiving. And really, that's what they're looking for. They may be mean and nasty. You know, hurt people hurt people, right? And they may be that way, but if you can go to the next level and you can be loving and you can be forgiving, you know, take it on as a personal project. Take it on as a personal project and find somebody you know, maybe it's a waitress and she's being rude and nasty to you and instead of you getting mad because you're getting lousy service and she's talking, try to turn it around and try to help her have a good day and, and maybe give her a, you know, talk about how she's doing a good job and, and find something to brag about and then give her a big tip at the end. Try to turn that around. Be loving, be forgiving. And I tell you what, it makes all the difference in life some people are just looking, just like Paco. He was looking for reconciliation. Who can, you, who can you lead to God? Who can you let know that there's a God who loves you and who cares about you and cares about your life so much? 
Let me tell you something. It don't matter what your past has been. We all have a past. Jesus Christ died to atone for your sin. And no matter how bad you've messed up, how far off the line you've got, Jesus loves you and he cares about you. And he, he's got his arms open wide and said, come on, man, come on, be reconciled. And we need to be those kind of people who people can see that in our life, that we are loving and we are forgiving. Everybody say loving and forgiving. All right, the last thing is this. Do good things for other people. Do good things. We're talking about the highest life. Do good things for others. Galatians 6 says, let us not grow weary or become discouraged in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap if we faint not or give in. So then, while we, are, while we as individuals, believers, have the opportunity, let us do good, everybody say do good, to all people, not only being helpful, but also doing that which promotes their spiritual well-being and especially be a blessing to those of the household of faith, born again believers. So it tells us to do good for all people. Well, sometimes doing good for somebody is not giving them what they deserve. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 says, See to it that none of you repays another with evil for evil, but always aim to show kindness and seek to do good to one another and everybody. You know, there's something about doing good for people, even if you don't know who they are, but just going out of your way to be a blessing to other people, that it adds something to your life. Um, the Bible talks about it in Proverbs eleven twenty five. 25. It says, he that waters will be watered himself. I like the Amplified. It says, the generous man is a source of blessing and shall be prosperous. What? The generous man, or you could say the generous woman, is a source of blessing. Are you a source of blessing? I mean, do you think, of, when you get up in the morning, you're fixing to go, most of you go back to work, go back to school maybe, whatever it is you're doing. Do you think of yourself as I'm going in here and I'm a source of blessing? I'm going to be a blessing with my words, my actions, my smile, my kindness. It says if you're a source of blessing, then, then you're going to be blessed. You'll be prosperous and enriched. And he who waters will himself be watered, reaping the generosity he has sown. The Message Bible says the one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. So, so let's, let's do good. I mean, I'm talking about people you're around. Find somebody. What Do you think of yourself that way? I want you to think of yourself as somebody who is a blessing wherever you go and you're looking for people. Maybe you don't know them. Maybe, I mean, me, I'm not the kind of person, I don't normally give people money if the side of the road holding up a sign and all that stuff and I'm not telling you to do it. Uh, that's not much of my personality, but I will if the Lord leads me to. But maybe there's somebody you can just do good for. And maybe it's just being kind. Maybe it's not money. Maybe it's being generous in some other way. Maybe it's being loving, helpful, not returning evil for evil, but blessing them and being kind and good to them and being patient. And maybe they need that because they're having a terrible day. Are you here? So that's our homework. I'm giving you homework for the holidays, okay? And so this week, I want you to do good for somebody. Somebody who maybe you don't even know at all. Christian, non-Christian, I don't care. I want you to do good for somebody. Everybody say, do good for somebody. How many of you are going to do it? Raise your hand. I want to see. You're going to find somebody to do good to. All right, wait. No, wait, wait, no. Put, put them hands back up here. All right, Father. You're better at counting than I am. They said they're going to do good to somebody. So I'm asking you to give them an opportunity. All right? Amen. I'll put your hands down. Now, here's another one. You do good to somebody, then I want you to do good to somebody in the household of faith. In other words, in the church or that's a believer and you find a believer and you're just going to do something good for them. Okay? Because he said especially do that. Well, if he said especially, that means especially. Right? So you find somebody in the household of faith, you're going to be good to them, you're going to be kind to them. They don't have to go to this church, just somebody who you know is a born again believer. And you're looking for an opportunity and you're going to try to do something good for them. Amen? 
And I tell you what, what's this going to do? When you start thinking that way and you're going out and it may be whatever, whatever comes your way, always remember I'm here to be loving and forgiving. I'm going to do good to other people and that's going to give me the highest kind of life. Amen. Amen. All right, bow your heads with me just a minute. So I was thinking about this and I don't know, while I was talking about, for some reason, the story of Paco. Here a few minutes ago as I was talking about him being reconciled, I really felt like, and there may be more than one, maybe more than this, but I was thinking about there's a man in here. And you are not reconciled to God and you have, in fact, you've thought, I've messed my life up so bad. I've messed my life up. I've hurt people. I'm hurt. I feel abandoned. I feel like nobody cares about me. And I, I, want, I want to start over. I, I want the mercy of God. I want my life to be changed. I want to be reconciled to God. And if that's you, I, I want you to know God loves you so much. If you could only grasp how much he loves you. He loves you so much he sent his beloved son to die for you and to take your place because he wants you to come into his family. And maybe you're like the story of that young man Paco and you're away from God. Let me just tell you something. God has already atoned for your sins by the blood of his own son and he loves you. Maybe you're here today and you were a Christian. At some time you prayed a prayer and you followed Jesus for a while, but you've got away and you're not serving God and you know it. And you want to come back and you want to be reconciled to your heavenly father. Or maybe you're here and you don't know God, and you're not sure that if you died, you'd go to heaven. You're not sure you'd ever been born again. You've never publicly confessed Jesus. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. You have to make a decision with your life. Who's going to be your God? Which road are you going to travel? And if you're here today and you're not right with God on the count of three, I want to pray for you. Anybody in here? Nobody looking around? I'm going to have you raise your hand and I want to pray for you. Are you ready? Okay, good. I'll shoot your hand up right now. Just raise your hand. I respect that. I respect that courage this guy has. Thank you. Young man here. Anybody else? I see a couple over here. Anybody else? Thank you. Is there one back there? God loves you so much. You're not right with God and you say, I want to start over. I want to get everything right. I see a young lady back here. Thank you. Anyone else? God loves you. Young lady up here, thank you. God loves you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Yes, sir, I see that hand. Thank you. God loves you. If you're watching online, we're all going to pray this prayer. Those of you that raised your hand, we're going to pray the prayer. After the prayer, I'm going to be up here. We have Bibles. We have materials we'll give you to help you get started in your walk with God. But know this, the, this, the scripture says that this is the record God has given to us eternal life. That's Zoe, the life of God. He that has the son of God has life. When you receive Jesus Christ, you receive on the inside of you eternal life. The life of God, the love of God, you're going to be changed. God won't even remember your sins anymore. That's what he said. So we're all going to pray this prayer out loud. And those of you that raised your hand, say it out loud where you can hear yourself with your own ears. Are you ready to pray? Everybody say, God in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for my sins, who rose from the dead. Today, I make Jesus the Lord of my life. Jesus I'm calling on your name. Forgive me. Cleanse me from all sin. Give me eternal life. I receive you as my Savior. And not only that, I make you the boss, the Lord of my life. Teach me your word. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to serve you and to help other people. Take my life and make it something. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen and amen. Give the Lord some praise for that. I love you.
All right, if you're watching online and you prayed that prayer, if you will contact us, we'll send you a Bible and free materials because we love you, Jesus loves you, and he's got a great plan for your life. All right, everybody stand up on your feet. High five two people. We love you. God bless you, and we'll see you on Wednesday night. It's going to be great. You be here. You're going to enjoy it. Hallelujah.